doctors really have to determine their safety. And it's so sad that we have to fight so hard and things like this are a challenge because you would think everybody around us would be like, that's a no-brainer. Right. Get right. on that right away. Let's do it. You know, right. because we could save lives. Right. Um, I had had many bouts of physical abuse, many bouts of, of him inflicting physical abuse, and many bouts of him inflicting other types of damage to me. But why was I still here? I mean, it sounds so cliche. No, it wasn't until after the kidnapping, because he got charged with kidnapping. That was a yeah. felony. Yeah. Um, so they let him go. Well, of course, that also escalated his behavior. Yeah. Because I, I, you know, particularly as I moved through my journey, I just kept thinking, this was a bright man. This was a, you know, he had this heart. We we did some, sometimes have fun. It wasn't all abuse. He was the funniest right. guy I knew. Um, so always kind of wondering and never being able to figure out why was the need for control so, so deep. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Cynthia Motters. This is the Army Pink Podcast. I want to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, we have a very special guest today. But before we get started, I wanted to tell you a little bit about Army Pink. Army Pink is a brand that I started with Robin Beamett. And it's all about shining a light on abuse. And it's a podcast that we think is very empowering when abusers get the opportunity to tell their stories, share their struggles. And through that, other people can learn, have takeaways, maybe find some tools. And then we like to bring on guests that can also enlighten you on uh, various avenues to take um, to maybe spot signs that you haven't noticed. Um, so it's really a helpful tool. And it's a lifestyle brand that will be moving out in various products. We did start with our Army Pink Peace Pendant, in which we donate a dollar to Peace Over Violence for every one of these sold. And that provides uh, free transportation to somebody in a domestic abuse situation because sometimes the most an important thing is getting out of there safely. Um, so today I'm going to introduce my guest. It's Ruth M. Glenn. And uh, Ruth is the president and CEO of the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence. And welcome, Ruth. We're so happy to have you. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, I, I do feel like I should clarify because this is a change that has happened very, very recently. I am now the president of public affairs for the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence and the Hotline. Okay, very good. And we want to learn more about your mission and all of that good stuff. Um, I want to give a little bit of your background. I should say a lot about your background. <laughs> because wow, when I started like doing some research with you, I was like, oh my gosh, she's like been to the White House with President <laughs> Biden and with Angelina Jolie on various interviews. Um, and then I guess recently you also uh, are an author of your book, which is Everything I Never Dreamed, um, which for those who maybe didn't pick it up or read it, we can learn a little bit more about that. But um, as I said, Ruth has been to the White House. She's had a big effort and mission against you know, violence against abuse. She's been interviewed by some of the most prestigious journalistic outlets, such, such as the New York Post, the Wall Street Journal, the Daily Beast, NBC News, NPR, and so on and so on. I mean, it's incredible. Um, and you've spent about, what, 28 years in this field dedicating your life uh, yes. to this mission, which God bless you. Thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, that's just amazing. And so um, with that, I think we should kind of go back to where it started. And, you know, I know you've told your story a million times, but I think it's important for people because when I was doing some research, I think you said that, you know, you didn't come from this background. No. And so this was unknown territory. So I, I think it kind of caught you off guard. Like what is going on here? Right. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. So with that, yeah, well, let's do that. Talk about the story and then we can go into some of these other segments. Absolutely. Um, so uh, to provide you with the short version, um, I was 16 when I married my husband, or 16 when I met my husband, we got married when I was 19. Um, the violence 
uh, commenced almost immediately. Um, I was with him for about 13 years. Um, the emotional and uh, psychological abuse were probably the most damaging to me. I know they were actually, mm -hmm. but there were all types of abuse throughout that relationship. I had someone who approached me um, when I was about 30 who said, I think I know what's going on for you. I think it's domestic violence. If you need anything, you let me know. Um, I left that I left him, but it didn't do it immediately um, because I was that fearful. Um, I oh, I was going to say because you thought it might be getting better or you could get make him better. I thought I, I thought I could make him better up to that point. Absolutely. I endured that for 13 years thinking this is going to get better, you know, um, trying to figure out what I was doing wrong and all of those kinds of things that that happen for victims of domestic violence. Um, but I think it's important to know that it took me two years to leave after I kind of knew what was happening and was trying to assess my safety. Um, he was he was very adamant that he would kill me if I left. Um, wow. Yeah. So I, I want us to be careful as a society telling people to leave because we really want to make sure they're safe when they do that. And they're the only ones that can make that judgment. Of course, unless it's a, a literal in your face, life and death situation, but right. Uh, what survivors really have to determine their safety. Um, I left, uh, that was in 1991 or two. I can, I'm sorry. I don't remember. I, I'm awful at dates. I usually have to call my girlfriend and say, <laughs> what happened? um, and, and I'm sure it's, it's a result of the trauma, but dates are really hard for me. But anyway, um, eight months after I, well, six months after I left him, he kidnapped me at gunpoint and held me for four hours. I was able to lie my way out of it. Wow. I would be safe. Um, a couple of months later, he found me, followed me, um, shot me, left me for dead. Um, I, I do want to reassure you and your audience that there were no lasting physical injuries. Um, thank God. Uh, thank God. I was shot twice in the head and <sighs> once in the arm and, uh, and, and, you know, I walked away with a skull fracture and not to minimize it. I just feel very fortunate. Um, lots and, of, and that was after you left, right? Correct. Exactly. Yeah. Eight months after I left. Yeah. Eight. Um, and we had our, I have our son just to be clear about that. So um, the challenges of trying to keep him safe, trying to make sure that he could still go to school and, and knowing that all of this, was going on in the background. Um, I also happened to be a person who was able to keep her job during all of this. So very fortunate in that way. Mm -hmm. And uh, did you do tell your work? I'm just curious. Did you, yeah. or, or were you embarrassed to tell anybody or did you tell them like, I've got a situation you need to know because he could like show up at your work or stalk you or right? Well, here's another interesting facet to the story. We worked at the same place. So, so I, I'll never forget the day that once this started boiling over into our workplace, um, they came to me and they said, you know, we have another site that you can go to. And I said, it was kind of that first time that I made a choice that, no, I'm not responsible for this. I'm very comfortable in this location. If someone should have to leave, it should be him. Uh, because that at that point he was stalking me and uh, stealing my our combined car, but the car, I mean, it just we were a two car family, so he would just take the car and you know all kinds of activities. So I was able to keep my job. Four months after the the uh, attempted murder, he uh, then took his own life out in another state. So he had been on the run. So my son and I were in hiding for almost four months. Oh, wow. Um, I I wish I could tell folks that, you know, I, I all of a sudden had this light where I was free and healthy. And and I would say to you, no, no, I was not. Um, and not just because of the shooting and not just because of, you know, all of those things. It really was, um, at first, of course, it was the grief. 
Mm -hmm. I remind people all the time, you forget that there's a human emotion involved in all of this. Um, I didn't marry him because I wanted abuse. I married him because I thought he was going to be the person that I was supposed to be with. Right. And I cared very deeply for him. So when he took his own life, of course I grieved. I was very sad. Right. Um, and and if nothing else, I was sad that he was a human being and decided that that was the way to still maintain that yeah. for me. Because was he going to go to jail? Did he know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. There was constant. Oh. He didn't want to face that. He did not want to face that. It's really interesting that you should ask that question because right after the shooting, of course, the detectives and the investigators asked me, you know, what should we prepare for? I said, you should prepare for him to take his life. I absolutely know that. because How now, did you know that? Well, number one, it was always a theme throughout, oh. you know, um, if you don't be, you know, if you don't blah, 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 we're both going to end up dead. I mean, it was just this ongoing kind of, I knew yeah uh, that he was also had he also had side uh suicidal ideations he really did right and i warned them i said when you find him because now there's an, a national manhunt for him through the fbi and the whole thing i said if you find him uh please please sneak up on him because if you don't he he will take his life and he did yeah he did. wow um I'll so, try. yeah so um, moving forward about a year later, I, I was finally feeling like I had my feet under me. I decided, you know, there must be some reason why I lived through this. Um, I had had many bouts of physical abuse, many bouts of, of him inflicting physical abuse, and many bouts of him inflicting other types of damage to me. But why was I still here? I mean, it sounds so cliche. Yeah. Why did I make it through? Right. Why did I make it through? Because let's be honest, many, many abuse victims do not. Um, so I decided at that point to still have my same job, but um, working for the uh, State Department of Human Services, but decided I was going to start volunteering for domestic violence. And, and that um, led you here. And that led me here. I also decided because it was something he would never allow me to do to go back to school. So yeah. I got my bachelor, bachelor's and my master's. And before you knew it, two years or so after the incident happened, people began to ask me to speak. And I've never stopped talking about um, my own story. But of course, what I'm doing today is letting people have some insight onto victims and into this. Yeah. And speaking of insight, just a couple of things to your story. Like, did he demonstrate any kind of abuse when you were dating or did it happen after you got married? Remember I met him when I was 16. Yeah. Um, and I have to tell you, um, hindsight is 2020. Yeah, absolutely. But I was so in love. But I, when I look back, I go, there were these little things. Yeah. I wasn't able to put my finger on it. But, you know, the, and it wasn't like, you know, at night he turned into Dr. Jekyll. That had that wasn't it at all. What it was, was it, quite frankly, looking back, it was the loss of my autonomy. Mm -hmm. You know, that feeling like, well, I don't know that I would have made that choice. And I'm sorry, I just went to the grocery store or whatever those things are. Yeah. Uh, so, yes, those were. And, and don't we as, I don't mean to say like women or categorize us as women in a box. But back then, didn't we kind of think that, well, why did, why didn't, you know, yeah, he wants to know where I'm going. He has every right. I'm the wife. He's my husband. Why did I take too long at the store? I could see, you know, you start rationalizing. Uh, why didn't I get dinner on the table? You know, he worked hard all day. I mean, now we have a different right. mindset right. entirely. Right. Well, the jealousy, you know, that I think that's the one that got to me. It's like, you know, I, I felt special because he was jealous. You know, yes. um, I wasn't, in, from my own perspective, I wasn't a very attractive young woman. And I had grown up in this house that was dysfunctional itself. I grew up with six brothers and, you know, all of those things. Well, oh my gosh, he's jealous. That is, that's flattering. So flattering. Yes. Yeah. Um, so it was all of those kinds of things. You are absolutely correct. Yeah, yeah. I was with, I, on another podcast. We were talking about jealousy as one of those key things that, 
that is not a sign of love in any way, shape or form. And if there is such jealousy, that's a big red flag. And I know that, you know, as women, sometimes we're insecure and we have self-doubt. And so it, it is flattering. Wow. You know, they make me feel special and beautiful by not wanting anybody else to to possibly look at me or see me in that way. Absolutely. Um, and with all of that, I'd like to say, too, that, you know, for the longest, um, particularly when I first got in this work, there was a lot of victim blaming that I felt took place because um, people would say, well, we just have to work on their self-esteem, you know, my self-esteem. Yeah. But no, that, that's not the underlying issue. The, the, the issue is someone tapping into your low self-esteem and using that to abuse you. Right. Um, I always yeah. love to clarify that because it, it really is a victim blaming type of thing to say, well, you know, if you if you thought better of yourself and you were more confident or competent or whatever yes. it might be. No, no, no. Well, and I think also it plays into us saying, oh, well, what am I doing wrong? What's yeah. wrong with me? I'm causing this, yeah. you know, on the work front. In today's age, there is, it seems like, and you know more about this than I do, there's zero tolerance. Like if there's a whiff of like domestic abuse, he would have been like gone. No, like yeah. moving him to another, like you're fired, buddy, you're out of here. But that wasn't the case either, right? No, it wasn't until after the kidnapping because he got charged with kidnapping. That was a yeah. felony. Yeah. Um, so they let him go. Well, of course, that also escalated his behavior um, because there were only two things that he had control of at that point. And that was his job and me. Well, if you take one more element of his control away, um, I'm all that's left that he, he, you know, he's struggling to maintain control over. And um, yeah. I'm not saying that they that they caused that. What I'm saying is his mindset around it. Yes, it yes. was. I only have control, you know, the, there's only one thing left that I can try to regain yeah. control of, and that's her. Was he um, remorseful? Sorry. Uh, did you guys have those conversations? No. Um, no. So long story short, because I know we're limited on time. Yeah. Here's here's what happened. And the only time I never got to talk to him uh, one to one after the shooting. I remember the last word I heard from him as I was laying on the ground where you're not dead yet, bitch. Oh, that was it. And he drove away. Yeah, I was able to get up and get in the car and you know, all of that. I went back to work about three weeks later, because seriously, I was I was fine, maybe even two weeks later. And I was working a graveyard shift and the phone rang. And I picked up the phone and he was on the other end sobbing. Yes. Oh, I can't even begin to tell you uh, what that felt like. But in the the uh, in the question that you asked around remorse, that was the only other time that you saw that. Yeah, the only other interaction we had, and to me, that was his demonstration of remorse. And did that weigh on you at all? Did you, for a minute, think no? You were like, <laughs> yeah, no. It. I mean, it did. Uh, all of it weighed on me about him. Yeah, because I. Uh, you know, particularly as I moved through my journey, I just kept thinking, this was a bright man. This was a, you know, he had this heart. We we did some, sometimes have fun. It wasn't all abuse. He was the funniest right. guy I knew. Um, so always kind of wondering and never yeah. being able to figure out why was the need for control so, so deep. Yeah, yeah just that power and control. You know, you talked about the the exiting and the planning to leave. And that's really important. Like you said, we are quick to say, oh, get out of there, like immediately. But you could be putting your life in some serious danger because if it, it sounded like, and in your case, if he thought for a minute you were planning to leave or you're like, I'm out of here, but you would have been dead maybe even you know, he would have tried that earlier. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, uh, you know, it seems like there should be like a planning guide or, and maybe you have this uh, in, in your mission with the National Coalition. Um, like, how do you set that up? Do you get a safe place? Do you tell only few people? Do you, you know, where do you even begin? 
you begin with what's comfortable and safe for you. Mm -hmm. It may be letting your neighbor know when my light is on, please call the police. It may be hiding money away because you do have access to your finances and sending a hundred dollar a check a month to your friend and say, hold on to this to me for me. Hold on for this uh, to this for me. It may be, um, you know, um, I mean, there are stories abound sending your kids on vacation like they always go to camp. And then you disappearing with them. You know oh. what I'm saying? So there are many and various ways. What we suggest, and we have sort of a guide on our website, but what we suggest is look over that guide, do what fits for you. Right. It is so very challenging. So you're not only talking about your safety, right? Mm -hmm. You're also right. talking about what do I do about the kids' school? What about the fact that I don't work at all? Where, what safe house is going to be safe for me and my kids and comfortable? Right. I ask people all the time. I say, because, you know, they, they say, well, you can just go to shelter. Well, that might be an option. Yeah. But I ask any of us, to because we ended up in shelter twice during uh -huh. that, that interim. Yeah. I, I ask people to think, how many times would you consider if somebody came to you and said, Pack up everything that's important to you right now and move within the hour. Yeah, that's a big deal. Yeah. It's huge. Yeah. Uh, you've got to remember to bring all your documents. You've got, you know, is that safe house far enough away? Well, are my aunt and uncle going to be surprised because I tell them that I've been experiencing abuse and they don't believe in me leaving my spouse? I mean, right. there are so many considerations. Yeah. Every victim survivor must make their own assessment about their safety first. And then what is it that they need to do it? Not comfortably, but, uh, you know, with some things intact so they can continue on. Yeah. Because each situation is, is different, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, that all that's so helpful. And um, segueing to your book, everything I never dreamed um, can you tell us a little bit about that for those who haven't read it and what kind of, you know, they can expect in picking that book up? Sure. Um, I talk about, you know, my childhood a little bit. The two women in my life who were just amazing, which was my mother, of course, and uh, she had her stuff. Um, and then the journey for my mother-in-law and I to become um, really good friends after. The oh, wow. Uh-huh. That's interesting. Yeah, they've both left us, but um, it, the, oh, sorry. the the wondrousness of her ability and my ability to figure out how to do this other journey together was quite remarkable. Um, and then I talk a little bit about the actual interactions between us, him, him and I over time and the abuse and, and um, you know, some of the things that he would say to me and, and that kind of thing. But then the second half of the book is where I'm hoping that I, based on my own story and based on, you know, other survivors I've spoke with, it's hopefully identifying what I see as gaps in policy and response to domestic violence victims and survivors. Mm -hmm. uh, not a whole lot, but, uh, you know, it, it's one thing to put your memoir out. It's another to do it without what I think might be solutions. Might. Yeah, right. So that's what I've done. Did you, your mother-in-law know her son was so flawed and sounds like she did and she supported you? So she knew when we were married, um, but like my, even my own mother, they were both in real denial. Yeah. Um, I never outwardly said, I'm in big, big trouble here. Um, after he passed away, of course, she blamed me. And I remember telling her, I'm sorry you feel that way. Um, I, that, you know, whatever you feel won't, will not prevent me from making sure that my grandson or your grandson knows his grandmother and, and we can figure out what that looks like. But I, it's not my fault. Yeah. I said, what I would suggest for you is to get some help. Mm -hmm. And she did. Um, wow. it for a couple of years, but eventually we came to this crosswords crossroads where we started our own journey um of healing and we did 
Um, wow. That's yeah. beautiful that you were able to come kind of full circle on that. Yeah. No. And you were, were you, um, it looked like you were very helpful in supporting uh, the reissuance of the Violence Against Women's Act. Is that yes. correct? Yes. Um, I, I wish I could take full credit, but yeah. I cannot. Um, but our organization with about 30 other allied organizations just worked hard for two, three years to make that happen. Um, and uh, the reauthorization was wonderful. Um, it also gives us a tiny little break before we start gearing up for the next. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes. And what is some of some of the benefits of of that bill that act? So um, it, it, it's really broad, I'm sure. But, right, but but most importantly is that we determined as all of these organizations that we really needed to be even more inclusive of those who experience violence. Right, right. Um, our Native American sisters and brothers really struggle on their lands to get their needs addressed as domestic violence victims and survivors. LGBTQI plus community um, is often not acknowledged as far as, I shouldn't say not acknowledged, but they don't receive the services. We wanted to make sure that we shored up first responder support for training. Oh, yes, very important. You know, Gabby Batito's case was a perfect oh. example of, yeah, what happened here? We have a gap in how this should have been done. So yeah. those kinds of things okay. are what are new. And, and then, of course, as always, we wanted to make sure that there's technical and tra technical assistance and training offered to advocates yeah. um, so that they can provide the best services to victims and survivors of domestic violence. You know, Ruth, since I've been doing this and, and you know, having these interviews, I'm, I'm a little perplexed that we don't have any curriculum in schools like not only for abuse, but sexual trafficking, which I'm just shocked that it's 2023 and we have sex trafficking. Like, yeah. it's just unbelievable. But it seems like, you know, we should have some kind of education process to, you know, for you, like in your situation, you know, oh, wow, here's a sign. This is not good or jealousy is not flattering. You know, just some tools in our toolbox. You know, Cynthia, I couldn't agree more. And I gotta tell you, if I have, and I think I talk a lot about it in the back part of my book is around that prevention. You know, I think if the interventions that we have in place are getting better, I think we have a long way to go, but why aren't we doing more prevention? Why aren't we figuring out how to get into the educational system? I gotta tell you, we've tried as an organization, it's a very difficult system to break into. Um, you know, curriculum is one thing and having teachers figure out how to either uh, wrap it into their curriculum or you have an education board who wants no part of it or an education system who wants no part of it or, you know, the, the, the uh, more complicated than most any other system we've encountered, quite frankly. Um, yeah. Because if you're looking at nationally, uh, goodness knows, um, but, uh, you know, even, even I, I thought that other systems were a bit of a challenge. This one, it truly is a challenge. And it's so sad that we have to fight so hard and things like this are a challenge because you would think everybody around us would be like, that's a no brainer. Right. Get right. on that right away. Let's do it. You know, right. because we could save lives. Right. What I would like to plug really quickly while we're on this yeah. topic is that the hotline call, has a, um, a site called Love is Respect. Now, Love it's it. not an edu educational curriculum, but yeah. what it does do is helps young people identify what some of those red flags are, the warning signs, whatever you want to call them. And it's pretty good. Um, yeah. But even that is more of an intervention type of, of deal. But if we're talking about young people and what they might need, um, the love is respect is a, is a good place to start. If there's, I love that. Yeah. I, is that. Is that what your national coalition kind of that uh, one of the taglines they came up with? Because that's the hot, yeah, the hotline did. Because remember, yeah. we're, we're joining forces. So yes, yes, the hotline has love is respect. Um, we had a curriculum for longest called um, um, healthy relationships for teens. Um, it is still available on our website. 
um, that we haven't been able to gain the traction because of what we talked about. And it was yeah. more of a preventive tool than, than love is respect. Love is respect is a more of an intervention tool. I gotcha. Yeah. Um, well, I know we're going to be winding up. I'd love you to talk a little bit about the mission um, that the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, some of the things they're doing and, and the great things they're doing, actually. Wonderful. I'd love to. Um, so we have um, what I call three pillars for actually uh, projects where we work with other entities who want to do something about domestic violence. They fund us or they partner with us. Um, to make things happen. For instance, Tom Shoes partnered with us a couple of years ago to deliver a series of webinars on emerging issues. Um, mm -hmm. That's only one example of many. And then we have our, our programs, which are webinars that are designed for victims and survivors mm -hmm. and advocates. Um, we have other programs in place as well, but the webinars are a very good example of the programs. Um, you just simply get on our email list and you're notified whenever that is. And then we have policy. Um, where we work with Congress and anyone else and with our allies to address issues such as the Violence Against Women Act or FIPSA, the Family Violence Prevention Services Act. Our mission is really around supporting victims, survivors, and advocates, mm -hmm. holding abusive persons responsible, um, and ensuring that we do all that we can to ensure that we're as inclusive as, as possible as a nation addressing this issue. Our top as NCADB, our top um, priorities right now are the intersection between firearms and domestic violence. Okay, yeah. And ensuring and that no that we do all that we can to not only ensure that funding remains in place, mm -hmm. but if there are things that we can do to increase funding, support services for victims and survivors, we're going to be there front and center. That's that, that's great work. Wow. Thank you for doing all that and being a part and doing it for so many years, too. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and I, hope, I hope people will reach out and find your book. It yes. sounds like it's a very valuable tool. And uh, for everyone watching, you can go to www.ncadv.org, right, for more information correct. and planning and guiding and, and webinars uh, to help everybody. Ruth, I can't thank you enough for being our guest today. I know you're very busy and we appreciate all this great information and all the things that you're doing. Thank you so much, Cynthia. It was absolutely a pleasure and thank you for those great questions. Yeah, my pleasure. Okay, I'm going to follow you and watch you and okay. see all, all the moving and shaking that you're doing. Okay, that sounds all right. great. Thank you, Ruth. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. I want to introduce our very special guest, and her name is Kathy Picard. And Kathy is going to share her own story. You're yeah. an inspirational speaker. Two books that you've written, I Love You So Much, That, and My Life with My Idiot Family, which <laughs> I can't wait to learn about what that's going to be about. For abuse victims, it is incredibly hard to get that out. And in fact, they hold this in, uh, and I didn't know this, for over 20 years or 25 years or something. Yeah, it, and it makes sense if you think about it this way, where the survivor actually has to be in a safe place, you have to have somebody in your network, somebody that you trust, that you're going to tell your story to. And then on the twofold, you need that other person to be that person to be able to help you, not to dismiss you. Mm -hmm.